Danielle, it's so interesting that you, you know, you look at this and, and you said the wording, um, you know, we're looking at this day by day and, you know, I agree with you. And, and I say that in the sense that I, I feel like, and I'm not like, I'm an equities girl. Uh, that's where I spent my career. And, and by nature, equity people tend to be more optimistic and positive than the fixed income people. But I will tell you that when I look at the markets and, and how resilient they've been over the past couple of weeks, I am a bit, I'm a bit surprised. Like, look, I want the markets to go up, but, but I'm a bit surprised. And, um, you know, particularly because you say day by day, we don't know what other impacts the higher interest rates are going to have on balance sheets. So let's talk a little bit about that. What are you seeing? in terms of some of the cracks or areas to be mindful of? Well, you know, it, it was interesting because in, in the buyout of, of, of New York Signature Bank, um, the, the bank doing the buying refused to take on $60 billion uh, in, in, in commercial real estate loans. So they had to leave that with the FDIC. So the FDIC is in turn going to have to assess banks for any losses incurred on that $60 billion loan book that the acquirer refused to take on. And that tells you something. So Newmark Group was, was hired and they're going to be in charge of dispensing with this $60 billion uh, portfolio. But that's going to give, I think, the street a better idea of how impaired the assets are on bank balance sheets. We, we've been talking for weeks about the difference between a mortgage-backed security that was priced maybe with a 2% or 2.5% coupon, and maybe now mortgage rates are 6%, 6.5%. And that differential really, it, it, it just reflects the loss due to interest rates rising. But you have those same losses because interest rates, borrowing costs have risen. You have those same losses plus to a degree permanent impairment because we know that office buildings are not going to fall to fill back up. They're saying that, you know, on, on a four and a half trillion dollar loan book impairment uh, throughout the United States commercial uh, uh, real estate. Um, um, and that's across banks and other lenders that there might be a trillion dollars of impairment there. That's a big number. Hmm. It is. And, and we I don't think we've really kind of looked at it from that angle yet. I mean, I'm sure hmm. you have in, in your conversations. But I, I guess one of the questions I would have as well, I mean, you know, in, investments is a lot, in investing or, or actual securities, it's a lot about timing as well, right? So in other words, you know, the, the issue with SVB was that they had these long duration bonds. At some point, they would mature up par. In other words, you know, you'd be made whole, you'd be able to pay your depositors, but the timing didn't work, did not work for them. Um, so when we think about the commercial loans or the mortgage-backed securities, what, what do we need to know about that as well in, in terms of the, the timing and when you're making So forward? again, um, you know, the, the reason I raise the, the, the particular example of the $60 billion loan portfolio is that in a normal, uh, in a normal slowdown, that commercial real estate saga would play out over a number of years, if you will. But because mm -hmm. of the immediacy of what's just happened with banks, and because the, the, the deposit flight continues into 5% yielding money market funds, uh, we're not going to have the same grace period, if you will, to determine what the valuations are for the underlying collateral backing these loans. And I think that that is something that investors really should be prepared for. The only analog that I can provide is from March to May of 2008, after the Federal Reserve first opened the discount window to securities brokers, the S&P 500 rallied 15%. Uh, and hmm. there was a lot of hope that a Band-Aid, if you will, was going to be able to cauterize the entire wound. And that certainly wasn't the case. Of course, stocks continued to go down after that May 19th interim peak because they found out, you know, what regulators, they don't have a silver bullet. They could not resolve everything. And that's what we were talking about earlier, that this probably is not what we would consider to be fully over. Right. Um, you know, it, it's interesting as well when I when I think about um, how the FDIC came in and, and the organizations and the government to kind of kind of save the day. Um, you know, I, I, I said to somebody the other day, I'm like, look, someone's going to pay the price for this. And he said, no, no, because they're just really they're just loaning the money out. I'm like, yeah, but that's one bank or two banks. Like what happens if there's more? What happens if there's other to your point, other assets? And like at some point. I think, I mean, at some point you have to print money to, to solve well, this. Well, it's, it's not so much that you have to print money. It's that 
the special assessments that the FDIC charges banks based on their deposits or the size of the bank, that's eventually right. going to filter through to what U.S. consumers pay to get banking, uh, to get the banking services. So it's some, some way, somehow, it's not that it's a taxpayer bailout, but some way, somehow, the consumer will pay. 